So welcome to the third part of our series on Advent. And if you're interested in Advent, I want you to know that I put a series of chats on the website. There are messages and little chats. And the chats, that means it's a little bit shorter, I put four on Advent in English. And it's not the same as this. So if you're interested, go online and you'll find it there. But this is our third in this particular series. And our focus has been to connect and understand the benediction or the blessing of Romans 15, 13, that we say so often, with the incarnation of Jesus. So what does incarnation mean? Well, incarnation means, in part, that Jesus came from God. It was a unique event in all of human history. And so Advent, like I said earlier, is this season of waiting and anticipating, reflecting, contemplating, to be able to celebrate Christmas and its significance for us. So Romans 15, 13, there it is. May the God of hope, wrote Paul, fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Andres, I'll say something that's not in your notes, but it's so easy for Christian people and in church contexts to say words like, may God give you hope and joy and peace. And we don't even know what we're saying. And people certainly don't know what we're talking about. And it would be helpful to think about Paul in jail writing these words. You say, well, my circumstances are different. My circumstances are hard and you want me to have joy? When I have this happening in my life, I have this problem, I have this person, hope. What is hope? Well, I know we all need hope. But remember Paul sitting in jail. Paul, like many of us, had things in his past that he had done that he was ashamed of. He hurt people, he put people in jail, he broke up families, he did a lot of bad stuff that later he wished he hadn't. He couldn't go back. He can never go back. Paul had all of those things in his life, and the physical problems, the challenges, the things he had hoped and dreamed to do that he would never be able to do, and yet he wrote, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, and so that's what we want to talk about today. Nate talked about hope, the hope that Jesus inspires, and I talked about happiness or joy, and how we can experiment, how we can, I'm sorry, experience and live with joy and share it with others. And so now we're going to speak about peace. God of hope filling you with all joy and peace. So, peace and joy are two sides of the same coin. It's a great phrase in Spanish, right? Two sides of the same coin. And this coin is actually from Mexico. But it's shiny, you can see it. Anybody's from Mexico, you can kind of collect the coin. Uh, joy and peace sometimes we have a passing joy like a, a, a momentary joy or happiness or peace because we have some happy circumstances so, oh how nice they turned on the air conditioner and somebody's like oh how nice they turned off the air conditioner and so you have that moment where you're happy for a moment but this blessing of Paul is talking about something more He's talking from the Hebrew, because he was from the Hebrew tradition and culture. He's talking about the Hebrew concept of shalom. Shalom, like that you would have a complete overall well-being, that all of you, everything connected together would be well, would be good. He's wishing shalom for you. And so we say, well, maybe we don't speak Hebrew, so we sort of identify with shalom, but not really. And so he means a profound contentment, a deep confidence and hope that by the faith and uh, the mercy and the justice of God, one day God will make all things well. And that takes a lot of hope to look at a desperately difficult circumstance that seems impossible and say, you know what? God's in charge. But someday, He's going to have to make that right. And so Paul says we can have that kind of peace in almost all of his letters. If 
go and just flip through all the letters of Paul. See if you can find one. If there's one or two. See if you can find it. It doesn't begin from the very start to say grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, like some of my messages can sound very simple, there's more than there meets the eye. If you're listening, grace and peace, what does Paul mean? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and he puts them together to all the people who don't realize that calling Jesus God the Father is probably the craziest and most important thing that ever happened in human history, because if that's true, whatever else we think or believe is secondary. If Jesus really is the one. And so Paul says grace and peace. When we remember the birth of Jesus, there's two things that kind of really jump out when you think of peace. If you ask people, what's the story of Jesus? How was he born? Peace. What are some first couple of things that come to mind? And I wrote down the most often quoted and the most famous. And they're not the same two incidents. A lot of little incidents, a lot of little mini stories that come together. Uh, wiki stories that come together for Jesus and his birth. They're different. The most often quoted comes from Luke chapter 1. And it's in verses 26 to 28 really all the way through 30. But I put the, the short version up there. And uh, God sent an angel, and that should say angel, but uh, that's my typing. In the six months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Since Luke is writing, Luke puts in all kinds of details so you can find out where it was, who was there, when it was, because he's writing as a historian to tell us these things really happened in a real time, in a real place. So this angel named Gabriel went to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then it goes on to tell her, Don't be afraid. Peace. Brings her peace. And so why I say that's the most often quoted, because I went to a Catholic school for a while, and so we learn by memory every day, many times throughout the, the, the prayer. That is, Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Hello Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with you. It's a great greeting, and it comes right out of Luke. That's what the angel said to Mary. But what's the most famous scene in Jesus' birth? It comes from Luke chapter 2. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host, meaning angels, appeared with the angel. So there's one angel and then there were many. Like when I saw one owl and then I saw many. But it was more amazing to see angels, I'm sure. They were praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace and grace. And so these are two events that are very um, similar, but they're very different. The angel was speaking to Mary when he said peace, about having peace in the midst of almost incomprehensible circumstances. Not even almost. They were incomprehensible circumstances for Mary to hear what she just heard from the angel. He said, peace. They were adverse. They were complicated from any human perspective. And so the angel's word to Mary was an invitation to receive this benediction, this blessing, this gift, a grace of God. It's Hail Mary, full of grace. You have grace, but I'm bringing you grace, grace, a gift from God. I'm giving you because actually you're about to face a really tough time. And it's not for today and tomorrow. It's not just for nine months until the baby's born. Because when the baby's born, you're going to have to flee. And then you're going to be, you know, outcast in another land. You're never really going to have a home. And your boy isn't either. And your boy's going to have a hard life. And you're going to watch him die. Yeah, but the angel thankfully didn't tell those things because if we knew what was ahead of us in life, we would lose hope. 
because life can be hard. But the angel said, you know what? Grace, peace, the Lord is with you. There's hope in that. And so, to trust in the promises and faithfulness of God, it can sometimes take a long process. And it's not as easy as, could you just turn off the air conditioner and then I'll be happy? Could you just serve my meal hot or on time? Or could I just pass this test? And somebody says, you know, I've been asking God for 30 years for something. And he never did it. So, I'm asking for the right things. Should I be learning something different? Should I look in a different direction? Good questions. I don't have any easy answers. But the peace of God comes to people in spite of their circumstances. And the peace comes from the presence of God. If God is present, we can experience his peace. And so peace still comes to us today from the presence of God. If you search for God with a humble heart and ask for his mercy, he will meet you on the road that you're on. You don't even have to be on the right road. You don't even have to be in the right place. You don't even have to be asking the right questions. And there are a lot of people searching, and they just got the wrong questions, and they're at the wrong place. I mean, they're not at Christ Church. How will they know? You know what? God goes out to meet people wherever they are, wherever they need him to be. He's there if we're open and listening. And that's an important truth. That gives us hope and can give us peace. So if you, but here's the other side. If you allow dark places in your mind and your heart, if you go to dark places and you get around dark people, God forbid that there be dark people, but there are. Then in those dark places, your life will reproduce fear, anxiety, stress, and those things turn into illnesses, all kinds of things that come. And so we've talked about dark places and other times here at the church. I don't want to go into that, but there's a great list in Galatians. Paul wrote about dark places. In Galatians chapter 5, he talks about that. He talks about it in almost all his letters. Chapter 5, 19 to 26, if you allow sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, Sorry, Andres, that's a fast list, and he was driving me nuts. But if you allow these things into your life, and there's a whole thing, fits of rage, selfish ambition, then um, you're not giving place for God, because he comes and he brings light. And if the light shines in the darkness, the darkness, you know, there's no, you don't want light and darkness. So that's easy to understand. In the most famous passage, the angels were talking with the sheep, with the shepherds, not with the sheep, with the shepherds, about universal global peace. Peace on earth. Now that's a great concept. What if there were peace on earth? Jesus brought peace to the world. So where is the peace? And the disciples asked him that, where is the peace? And that's a different message for a different day. But Jesus was bringing peace, and the shepherds were so excited to hear this message that they went and they told the whole town. Have you thought about that? The shepherds who were like, I said last week, they were kind of like the invisible people, probably not very highly thought of, or, and they're running around town telling people in the middle of the night, wake up, the baby's been born, or whatever it was that they said. They were sharing, they seen the angels, well... Within two years, there was going to be a great massacre of babies and children right there in that place. And you know, the massacres of babies and children and people and cultures just keeps on going. And we look around our world, and the peace that was promised doesn't seem to appear. I think sometimes, and I don't have an easy answer, I really don't, but I think sometimes we're looking for this global peace, and the peace really begins with people. God came to Mary, 
And then he came to Joseph, and he went to Elizabeth, and he went to Zacharias, and he went. And that's what Luke starts telling us. God went and to all these individuals. And he went to the shepherds, and he went to the Magi. And the Magi went to Herod. I mean, Herod knew. And he asked his counselors, and they said, yeah, there's a baby, and this is what it looks like, and where will it be? Bethlehem, that's the spot. That's what the prophets said. So person by person, people receive the news, and this peace needs to come from us to be shared with the community, and then the community to reach out to the world. And so if I don't have peace in me, how am I going to find peace from others? So some of us say, well, peace is inside you. Really, the light is in you. The message of Jesus is that he brought the light into the world from outside, because here there really isn't much light. I mean, the real question, people say, why are people so bad? The real question is, why is anybody even good? I mean, if you stop and think about it, why don't we just all live for ourselves? Do the best you can, get ahead, and take what you can while life gives you a chance. But Jesus brought something different. And the peace begins with us. And that's what the apostles learned, the disciples of Jesus. That's what they learned, and that's what they taught. And that's why Paul makes such an emphasis. And he always says, grace and peace. That's the first thing he starts out with. Because grace and peace comes from God. You don't really have it inside you. I don't have it inside of me unless God gives it to me. And he gives it to me so that I can share it with you. And he gives it to you so you can share it with me. Do that, guys? Great. May the God of hope fill you. We need, um, for the sake of those around us, that God would give his peace into our life. If we don't receive it, other people will not receive it through us. So when we resist the peace of God, I would never resist the peace of God, you know, bring me the peace. Well, we resist it by inviting dark places, allowing dark spaces in our life, and dark people, because we kind of enjoy that. You know, it's a lot of work to get rid of the dark. I'm packing to leave for next week, and it's a bunch of work to try to clean up the house so that somebody else can be there. Don't want to have to do that. And we have to clean up our life. Well, God will come and help us clean it up. You don't have to get cleaned up for him to come. But to receive his peace, we have to be willing to clean up. Say, if you want God to come, then the light shines in the, in the, in the darkness. And so... Sometimes we think, I'm okay. You know, I'm doing pretty well. I've made it this far. So I'm just going to kind of stay where I am and keep it going. But see, what God wants to do is let this peace fill you up and overflow. Like there's so much peace and grace and joy. That's not easy. But have you ever been with a person who just like, has grace and peace, not just like a nice person who is skilled at saying, hey, how you doing? So glad to see you. But somebody who really overflows with some grace and peace, maybe they don't talk much. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But if you've ever been with a person, you say, wow, I just really enjoyed the time spent with that individual or that place. You say, God wants you to be that kind of person for others. Just still be you. You'll just be more you in a gracious, peaceful, loving way. That's what God wants to do in our lives. So maybe that's why we give gifts at Christmas, the people that give gifts. Some people say, ah, don't give me anything. That's okay. Don't worry. I'm fine. I just want you to come. It's like my mom would say. But my mom loves to give gifts to everybody. So then I realized that she likes to give so many gifts, and she likes to get little gifts. And we say, you know, my mom's house is so full of little things. Please don't get her something else to crowd. She, whatever she gets, she just keeps adding it. But then we say, you know what? Who cares if she fills up every space with little things? My mom loves to get the gift. 
And so until for 10 years, oh yes, John bought me this from Uruguay. So I go find some little thing from Uruguay and I take it. And it gives her joy. Well, that's a simple joy. But God's work in our life is that we would receive and give. And that we would give and receive. And so you don't have to just be a giver, you have to also be a receiver. Allow somebody else the joy of doing something for you. And just say, thank you. Thank you. Some of you are good at that, and others maybe that's a hard thing. If we go back to Luke chapter 1, we will see, no, let me say that again. Go back to Luke chapter 1. Read it this week. Read it this afternoon. It doesn't take long. And look at the difference. See if you can find the difference between the reaction between Zacharias. I didn't even tell you his story. Some of you know it, some of you don't. But his, a little bit of his story is in there. Zacharias meets an angel. And Mary meets an angel. And see if you can find out what's the difference. Because the angel responds differently to both of them. And it's, it, it's, it's an interesting little study. There are a lot of descriptive words that Luke uses. And for example, he describes Zacharias, who is actually in the right place at the right time, asking the right questions. I mean, he's in a place where he's supposed to meet God, or see an angel, or do something like super spiritual, like that's what he's there for on behalf of the people. But he is so startled by an angel appearing, it says he was gripped with fear. Now, gripped with fear. That's intense. That's like some of, I get that around heights. And uh, I didn't really until I had children. Yeah, I'd take my children and then they would be, you know, maybe the, the edge of, we went to the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon, the edge of the cliff was as far as from me to that front row. So, I mean, there's a lot of people a lot closer. They're like peering over the edge. Uh, people fall and die every year. But when I was young, I sat on the edge and looked down. When I had kids, I was like standing away, and I was gripped with fear. I was like trembling, and we had a camera for our trip, and Natalie wanted to take a picture. And Lisa said, like, Natalie, take the picture. You're going to stand all the way back there. I'm like, don't give the kids your fear. And I trembled, and I handed the camera and dropped the camera and broke it. And uh, so, gripped with fear means you're just like, you can't function. I remember Zacharias was there to meet God. But when he did, he couldn't function. Anyway, read that. The text says that the people were puzzled. Mary was troubled. How would you have reacted? What if God chose to speak to you through a vision or a dream or some kind of a visit of an angel? In the Bible story, sometimes the angels are like, like what Zacharias saw, is like, or the shepherds are shining in the night sky and singing. And sometimes Paul said, you know, it could be a stranger at your door. It could be someone sitting near you and you didn't even know. So he said, hey, treat people well. You never know. He said, I don't really believe that. I don't believe in angels. Okay, you cannot believe. It's like Zacharias. Huh? Zacharias, I think he believed it. But then when it happened, he found out he didn't really believe. Luke knew that people would not believe. I'm not sure how easily it was, how easy it was for Luke to believe. Luke traveled with Paul for a long time. Luke and these other writers of the Bible, most of them got to know each other. They were together over years. They went through hard times. They were in jail together, different kinds of situations, different levels of education. Luke was one of the guys that tells the most about Mary. The scholars say, well, because he interviewed Mary. He spent time with Mary and said, tell me your story. And so there was a guy who heard all of this and didn't believe. Paul tells us that all over the Roman Empire, every part of the Roman Empire knew what had happened with Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection and the healings. Everybody knew but Luke wrote for a guy named Theophilus, and he called him most excellent Theophilus, some kind of a noble person. And he said, I carefully investigated everything from the beginning to write an orderly account for you, so that you may know the certainty 
have peace of the things you have been taught. So Theophilus is a gun. He's heard about it, but he's like, eh, I don't know. A lot of angels. I'm not sure I really believe in angels. Did angels really appear in a dream? Mm, it's kind of crazy. And so Theophilus wanted somebody who was informed and educated that he felt like he could trust. And he said, oh, I wonder if Luke, what Luke thinks about this. Luke is a doctor. Luke's a historian. Luke has traveled. Luke has seen every kind of thing. Luke, what do you think? Luke said, you know, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to ask. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to talk to the people. And I'm going to write, you that, write it down and let you know what I think. So, what if you were Theophilus? Or Luke? Or just you, right here where you are? What do you need to believe? Theophilus was, apparently, was like, I just need somebody I can trust. The way that they think, that they ask the right questions. What do you need in order to believe enough to receive the joy and peace of God? So just a quick look at the life of Joseph might help us. We talk about Mary, we talk about the shepherds. Joseph kind of gets passed over a lot of times. Maybe you've studied about Joseph. But I'm not going to tell you the story. You need to do your own homework and read the text for yourself. Maybe you're super, you already know it. And, um, but if you really want to learn, you, you won't learn enough just kind of listening to me. You need to read it, reflect on it, come up with your own conclusions. I'm trying to give you a basic orientation so that you say, wow, that was interesting. I'm going to think about that. I want to check into that. I want to do my own work and see what I can learn. Now, Matthew tells us a lot about Joseph. Uh, not really a lot, actually. We wish he would tell us a lot more. But he tells us that he was a just person. Like he made good decisions. He's dependable. He's reliable. He's honest. He's just, says Matthew. And that's a strong word in the Bible. Just is very good. But he says he was firm. Joseph resolved in his mind what he was going to do about Mary. When he found out that Mary was expecting a baby, and a baby wasn't his, it says that he resolved. Resolved means he spent some time, he thought about it, he reflected, and he arrived at a decision. And we don't know if he asked anybody's opinion. It seems like he resolved in his mind to divorce Mary. But he's just, so he was going to do it quietly, not make a scandal not put her on trial, all of those things. Maybe you know about the familiar with the laws. But we know Joseph is a guy that makes up his own mind, generally does a good job. But it's interesting that in this case, he did the wrong decision. He made up his mind in the wrong way. So God sent an angel, said, hey, Joseph, I really like you. I like Mary even more. And you can't divorce her. This really is something that God is doing, and I want you to follow through on this marriage. I want you to stay with her. And so, just think about it. He has anxiety. He has fear. He has worries. It goes against his culture. It goes against everything. Except faith. But you know, he wanted more. But the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus means God saves. So, Matthew says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel had told him to do. So a little while later, if you read the story, another angel, or maybe the same angel, appears to Joseph again in his dreams and tells him, you need to flee. They're apparently in Bethlehem, and the angel comes and says, you need to get your family and go to Egypt. It's a long journey. It's not an easy place to go. That's a different language. Some of you changed countries and changed languages. Is it easy? What if you don't have a job? You don't know where you're going. Whose place are you going? You know, how are you going to get there? Joseph, this time, didn't wait for morning, Matthew said. He woke up from his dream. He got the family together, and they headed out. 
he had learned that the other time the angel spoke to him, it happened the way Jesus said. The baby. And now he's a stronger believer. And the moment he woke up in the middle of the night, he said, let's go. Let's move. We're headed for Egypt. And imagine Mary. How did she accept that? Anybody here been a young mom? And your husband gets you up and says, hey, get on the donkey. We're headed out of town. You know. The Bible doesn't give us the details of their relationship. We all have different reactions. But the peace of God comes to our life. And when it comes, we need to receive it and then act on what we're receiving. So read Matthew 1 and 2. Think about Joseph. Think about the, the, the magi that came. Think about the reactions of Herod and his counselors. Everybody's living the same historic moment, the same situation, but they're all reacting different ways. Any common parallels with our life today? They have their own lives. They have their own perspectives. They have their own beliefs about it. And they all choose different paths. What are we going to do with the fact even Herod, even the teachers of the law, even the religious leaders in Jerusalem that seven kilometers away is being born a baby that the prophets foretold. And guys have come from the Orient just to check it out. And they didn't go. They made a different decision. My deep desire is that every person out there on Zoom, in here, wherever, you're watching it on the internet later, did we would all have an attitude of openness to receive the peace of God in our life. That we could allow God to reveal in us with his light where there's darkness or obstacles or pride or self-justification or anxiety or fears that are just rooted in false beliefs. That we could be like Joseph or Mary, or the shepherds, or the wise men that came from the east, all of them had to leave behind everything they thought they knew about the world in order to receive the peace of God. But they found his peace, and it was worth it. And we're still talking about them today. We're still receiving the benefit of the fact that they believed. So here's the question for you and for me today. Who will receive the benefit this week, next month, next year? Because you chose, choose to believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to believe for a new work in our life. We don't live in a world at peace. We live in a world at war. We live in families and workplaces that are at war. We live in a place of great darkness and times of darkness and fear and anxiety. And there are good things, for sure. And there are good people. And there's a lot to be grateful for. But there's a lot that is hard for us to see and to understand. And so help us find a way to sit in silence to read, to study, to put ourselves in a place where we can receive your peace. We're comforted that we don't need the right questions. We don't need the right knowledge. We don't need to be perfect in any way to come to you. You will meet us where we are. So Lord, hear each prayer. Have mercy on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.